All right, great. Well, um, welcome everyone to parts two and three of this last uh, lecture series. Uh, there were some technical problems in the beginning. We started a little late, so I'm going to try to still end this first half more or less on time, or maybe cut the break a little bit, but try to end the second half uh, when it's supposed to. So we started talking about symbolic powers on Monday, um, and we're really focusing on the case of radical ideals. Um, so the end symbolic power of an ideal is what I obtain when I take the ordinary power and I compute a primary decomposition for it, and I collect all the minimal components. So if you like, you're going to take your power, you localize it all the minimal primes of i, which in this case are also the associated primes of i, and can drop back to r. So these are really the elements that live in your power up to maybe multiplying by something that's not in any of those um, minimal primes. Now, um, at the end of last time, I said a little bit about some of the many difficult problems about symbolic powers that people think about. And uh, for most of today, we're gonna to be talking about a problem known as the containment problem, which is very easy to phrase. But it is an, a, a difficult question. And in particular, it's the question that sort of includes as a subproblem some of the other questions that I mentioned on Monday. So, roughly speaking, the idea is I'm going to hand you an ideal, and I want to know which containments of this kind I can make. So, which symbolic powers are contained in which powers? And um, many remarks to make. Maybe the first one is that this contains some other problems. So for starters, this contains the equality problem that I mentioned last time. If you want to decide if a particular power is equal to the symbolic power, notice in fact, it was here in my reminders that the symbolic power always contains the power. And I'm talking about a sort of backwards kinds of containments. So really, if I can make these numbers be equal, so if a particular symbolic power is contained in the power, that's really equivalent to asking for equality. So in a way, you know, what we really want to do this from a sort of best possible situation. And so given a B, I really want to find the best possible A that I can put in here. And the best case scenario is that I can make this number be equal to this one. Right? A priori, it, it can't be bigger, it can't be smaller. So um, you might, if you can solve this problem completely for each B finding the best A, you will in particular decide when you have equality. But even if you don't have equality, you can think of this question as a way of sort of um, comparing the, these two families of ideals. You have your ordinary powers, you have your symbolic powers, um, and you wanna compare the two, really because you understand the powers really well, but the symbolic powers are much harder to understand. And so you want to sort of extract information about the symbolic powers from the powers. So last time I mentioned very briefly that when you have a homogeneous ideal in a graded ring, symbolic powers are also homogeneous. And so you might ask about what are the degrees of elements in those symbolic powers. And we saw examples where those degrees were sort of unexpected, right? They kind of, in the example we saw, they're sort of too low um, to be in the power, but you might also, you know, see sort of unexpected things. Um, so maybe let me introduce a, a little bit of notation that I actually will not use in the rest of the lecture, but just to explain the problem. If I have a homogeneous ideal to J, the smallest degree of a non-zero homogeneous element in J, I would note it as alpha. And notice that, you know, if you happen to know that a symbolic power is contained in a particular power, then this automatically tells you something about these degrees. So if I want to compare the smallest 
possible degree of something in each one of these, well, this is potentially a bigger ideal, might have things of smaller degree, but whatever is the smallest degree of something in here, that's also in here. And so this guy is bigger equal than this. So in particular, notice that the, the, the degrees of elements and powers are really easy to compute, right? This is just B times whatever is the smallest degree of something in I. And so I, I mentioned last time that getting upper bounds for this smallest degree is really easy, but getting lower bounds is what's hard. So somehow if you, if you solve, if you, if you get a particular statement of this kind, you might gain information about lower bounds on degrees on, on symbolic powers. And in fact, um, there have been some, some recent uh, developments um, in terms of finding bounds on these lowest degrees that sort of involve not quite this containment, but, but related, related statements. So it is useful to consider containments like this. And there, there are many other reasons you might consider this problem, right? As I said before, it's sort of a comparison uh, question. And um, this is a question that first appeared in a paper of Schensel in 1985, um, but that really gained um, more traction um, in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. And um, this starts uh, thanks to work of Ian Swanson, um, who, who first understood a little better what it meant to say, well, okay, maybe first let me say it like this. Um, so, Chensel and others back in the 80s were interested in the question of when it even makes sense to ask this, right? So I was saying, given a B, I wanna find the, large, the, the best possible A to the smallest possible A, but uh, I haven't even addressed the question of whether that makes sense, right? Given a B, is there an A? So um, we can make that more precise by saying that these two families of ideals are co-final with each other. Um, maybe for the purposes of time, um, I won't write things, um, so precisely, but let me tell you about a theorem of Swanson's, which was published in 2000, which essentially says that there exists an answer for the containment problem. So let me put it like this, for all A's there's a B. Oh, I think I'm switching the letters, aren't they? No. For all of these are existing A. So really, there's an answer to the containment problem for all powers for this given I. So maybe let me clarify that I mean given I. This is really equivalent to actually the existence of a constant C that presumably as I'm writing it might depend on your ideal I such that the CN symbolic power is containing the nth power for all n. So you can think of this as sort of saying, if you can answer the containment problem, your answer is, is no worse than linear, right? The function that gives you the best possible thing you can, can put in here for each n is a worst case scenario or linear function. Um, and This sort of opened the door to trying to understand what what is this this constant C. So her proof didn't didn't give us it gave us the existence of a C, right? It didn't tell us what what this C is explicitly. But even more surprising, soon after, inspired by this, there came an answer over regular rings. So the theorem I'm about to write, and I'm gonna need a little bit of meditation to write it, was proved over C by Ayn Nezersfeld and Smith using the theory of multiplier ideals. And then soon after, Hawks and Hunicke, um, they proved the theorem in characteristic P using tight closure techniques. 
And then they uh, use reduction to characteristic P to get the theorem whenever your ring contains a field. So it's going to be some theorem about regular rings. And then um, for a long time, this was all we knew. And then very recently, thanks to uh, Andrea's solution of the direct summit conjecture using perfectoid spaces techniques, we started seeing solutions to all these other questions in mixed characteristic commutative algebra. And one of the first things we saw um, was the man Schwed sort of established the theory of um, multiplier slash test ideals in mixed characteristic. And I think that's now officially, I want to say 2018. Do I have it here? Um, aha, yes. Um, I will say their, 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 their work required the ring to be excellent. And I'm not going to write a theorem about excellent rings. Thanks to work of Takumi Murayama, who just a few months ago, so I think this appeared on the archive in November. Um, so sort of doing similar things to, to Man Schwed. Um, I'm going to put 2021, this is not published yet. So it's very, very recent. Uh, but he was able to remove that excellent assumption. So now we have a clean uh, theorem for all regular rings. So this is going to be some answer to this containment problem. It's going to tell us over regular ring, what is this constant C from Swanson's theorem? So what is the Swanson constant um, that, that is going to appear for regular rings? And for that, I need a definition so I can write the theorem. I need to tell you what the big height of an ideal I is. Um, so it's the maximum of all the heights of the associated primes of your ideal. I guess in our setting, our, our, our ideals are all radical. So you're really just looking at all the minimal primes and deciding what's their maximal height. So this is sort of um, a more honest version of the height than the usual one, right? The usual one is gonna look at all the heights of your minimal primes and choose the smallest one. And this instead will choose the largest. So in particular for a prime ideal, right? So if, if I is prime, notice that the big height is just the height. But um, the theorem we're about to write is a theorem that really requires this, this big height um, invariant. We can't replace it by the height. And what is the statement? Uh, well, let me say that I is radical of big height H. Do I need the assumption that the um, ideal is radical? No, I don't. Um, but then we have to talk about well, we have to say a little bit more about what this invariant is. The big height works, but you can do a little better. Um, I mean, you can't do better for radical ideals. This, this is the, the constant that, that you need to put in there. But we also didn't define symbolic powers in full generality. So the theorem, after I talked to for so long, you probably already guessed if you didn't know, is that the Swanson constant in this case is this big height. So um, looking at the time, there's maybe something I'm going to cut at the end. So maybe let me make a comment right away. Notice that as a beautiful consequence of this, we can actually take this Swanson constant to be independent of the ideal R. Because if you take D to be, let's say the dimension of R, that's the largest possible big height. Actually, we, we could take dimension of R minus one, but um, let's not worry about that. Um, so this tells me in particular, if I take the DN symbolic power, that's presumably bigger than the HN symbolic power equal, right? D is H or more. And so this guy is contained in here, which is contained in the power. But the amazing thing about this is that now we wrote a statement that doesn't depend on the other. You have a uniform constant that works um, for all ideals. And this is sort of a, 
a beautiful thing that often happens in Kimura Vasuka. Um, we have this sort of uniform behavior. So what we're going to do uh, for the rest of this first half is I want to prove this theorem in characteristic P. So really we're going to cover the hochster humiki proof in a characteristic P and how we're going to do that, we're going to use type closure. And, and the sort of, uh, really, we really will use very elementary characteristic P techniques, which I think maybe to me, this is one of the first theorems I ever saw. I really saw the, the power of characteristic P techniques because you know this is not this is not an easy theorem, and uh, the Einlass of Feldman proof in a way it, it's also sort of uh, beautifully elementary in some sense in the sense that you you just have to show a certain string of uh, containments, but it's actually very technical because each of those containments depends on some you know difficult properties of multiplier ideals. Um, but I love how you know we turn this complicated theorem into something um, very elementary using type closure. So we're going to need a few um, a few tools that you will prove as exercises. So actually, let me call this one a well. Okay, I'll write it as exercise. It's spelled out um, with a few more details in the in the problem set. So first of all, we're going to need that if you take a regular ring of prime characteristic, then um, taking Frobenius powers does not change the Fouquier prime. So this is really a result of this Kian spiegel it doesn't actually need the ring to be regular, but it needs the ideal to have finite projective dimension. So um, you write this down of a regular ring, but the proof you write is, is essentially the same. You're just going to use that your ideal has finite projective dimension. Well, okay, maybe you'll use, you'll use a, little, a little more than that, um, but it is true more, more generally. So one of the points of this is that Remember last time we talked quite a bit about associated primes and we said how um, one of the difficulties of dealing with symbolic powers is that it's really hard to study associated primes. And when you do things like taking ordinary powers, you lose control over your associated primes. But the beauty of being in characteristic P and being able to take Frobenius powers is that Frobenius powers do preserve associated primes. And this is going to be a key idea in the proof. Um, one more thing we're going to need. So we're going to prove a containment of two ideals. And uh, we're going to need a very elementary fact that containments are local statements. So to prove a containment, you want to prove that I is contained in J. It is sufficient to prove that that containment holds after you localize. And you've probably done this as an exercise in your first Kumina Vazuba course. Maybe you did it for all primes, or maybe you did this sort of finer version that I'm going to need. I'm going to need that actually it is sufficient to look at the associated primes of the larger ideal. Okay. So if somehow you can control the associated primes of the thing you're going to land on, and you can study your containment after all the localizations, then you've, you've won the game. And now, um, thanks to this, the first part of the puzzle, I'm gonna call it a theorem because it's called a theorem in my notes, but maybe it should be a lemma. This is, I'm about to write my very favorite version of the pigeonhole principle. So what is it? Um, if I have a radical ideal of bay high H in a regular ring, Then if I take, so I want to prove something about the HN symbolic power being contained in the N power. That's my goal ultimately. For now, I'm going to prove that that's true for powers of P. And I'm going to prove one better. I'm going to prove that I can land in the Frobenius power, which is smaller than the ordinary power. 
So proof. So step one, um, by the last exercise I just wrote down, um, it is sufficient to prove this at the associated primes of the potentially large right here. So I just want to focus on the associated primes of this guy. So sufficient to show after localizing at the associated primes um, of the Frobenius power. But then the first exercise I wrote down was that the associated primes of the Frobenius power are very well understood. They're the associated primes of I. So we only need to prove this containment holds after we localize at all associated primes of I. Let me write Q instead of P. Just because P is a characteristic and having two things called P is just confusing. Okay, so I need to prove this containment after we localize it in associated prime of I. I was some radical ideal, so I'm really talking about the minimal primes of I. And this is an, something I've said last time. What happens when I take a radical ideal and I localize in an associated prime of it? Well, I just had an intersection of a bunch of primes and I localize at one of those. The remaining primes are going to become the whole ring, so I'll just get that one prime. So after localization, this is a statement about the maximal ideal in what is now um, a regular local ring. And notice also that taking Frobenius powers, it's easy to show that that's something that commutes with localization. So again, in the localization, IQ is just a maximal ideal. So what do we need to show? I'm going to rewrite a statement now in this sort of easier local setting. So I have a, now I have a local ring. In fact, I have a regular local ring R. And I want to prove a statement about the maximal ideal. Well, okay, maybe there's a little bit more that I still need to write. So um, on this side, when I localize, I is going to become the maximal ideal. And I'm going to take its Frobenius power. On the other side, I have a symbolic power of I. The symbolic powers, remember, are the things I get when I localize at the associated primes. Okay, I'm saying, saying something different that's written here. These are the same. My guy is radical, right? I'm going to localize at each of those primes. I'm going to localize the power and contract back. So if I now take this and I localize again, so if I take my symbolic power and I localize, I just get the ordinary power. So down here, when I take um, I, H, Q, and I localize a Q, that's like taking IQ, which is our maximal ideal now, remember, and just taking an ordinary power. Again, because I, I localize it. Um, one of these minimal primes. This is kind of the definition of what the symbolic power is. So on this side, I have my maximum ideal and I took its ordinary power. So what I need to show is that in a regular local ring, something, what's left to understand here is what does the H have to do with anything? Well, H was the big height of I. So H was the largest height at one of these cubes that I might have localized at. So what I know about this regular local ring, sorry, I'm calling it R now. Well, its dimension, uh, maybe let me write it up here. Its dimension is the height of this prime that I localized at. And that's at most the largest height of an associated prime of I, which is that big height. So I might as well pretend that H is the dimension of my ring because I know the dimension of my ring is at most H. Worst case scenario. And now we want to prove this containment. So this is what we'll show now. Now we can pretend this is the theorem, and this is what I'm going to prove. 
And now, yes, I said earlier, this is my favorite version of the pigeonhole principle. And this is a very easy application of the pigeonhole principle. Why? Well, my ring is regular. So what I know about it, so since my ring is regular, I know that this maximal ideal is generated by at most each many things, right? It might actually be that the dimension is something smaller, right? That this was an, a minimal prime with smaller height, the, the big height, but it doesn't matter. I can always choose eight things that are going to generate this math one people. And so really now I'm, I wanna show that when I take an ideal generated by H elements and I take it H cubed power, that that is contained in the Q Frobenius power, so I really want to prove it. Now, it is of course sufficient to think of generators of the power. The power is generated by monomials on these x's. So the generators here oops, are things that look like monomials on the x's. And what you know about them well, I guess if I, if I wanted to pick a minimal set of generators, I could even take this equal to, but let me just say bigger equal than H two, right? If I go over all the monomials of this kind, I get a generating set for this um, ideal. And so if I prove that all these guys live in here, I am done. But what does it mean to be in this ideal? Well, I just need to check that in this monomial, I need at least one of these powers. So I need at least one of these AIs to be at least two. Well, this is where the pigeonhole principle comes in. I'm summing a bunch of um, integers, positive, non-negative integers. Uh, they sum up to H cube. If none of them was bigger than Q, Right, if they were all up to Q minus one, then no way they could together sum up to H cube. So this is automatically, actually let me erase the need, this is automatically going to get me what I want. If I have H many things summing up to H cube, at least one of them must be at least two. And so therefore, sorry for the funny writing, this guy, this generator, is indeed in the Fermi set. And so the thing that we proved after all this, so we, we, we reduced to the local setting and then we apply the pigeonhole principle and show that the HQ symbolic power is always contained in the Q Fermi power of any idea, a radical ideal of high age, a big high age. So note, I can do better. When I was applying the pigeonhole principle, I only needed that at least one of these guys was at least um, AI, it was at least Q. So I wanted to conclude that at least one of them was Q. So let's apply the pigeonhole principle a little more carefully. How do I make this fail? I want to conclude that one of them is at least Q. The, the, worst or best case scenario, depending on how you look at it, is that of these H many things that they're all smaller than Q, right? So if all of them were Q minus one or less, actually if all of them were exactly Q minus one, right? They would sum up to H times Q minus one. So in this situation, you would fail to have one of them to be at least Q. But now if I go and I add one more, over here, then necessarily at least one of these must be Q, right? Because we took sort of like the, the extremal case and, and we added one to that. So this is the best thing that the, the pigeonhole principle can possibly tell us. So we can improve our theorem to say that the HQ minus H plus one symbolic power, I'm just distributing the H, is contained in the Q Frobenius power for all Q. A 
Okay, so this was the key piece of the puzzle. And it was, like I said, it's just the pigeonhole principle. This is what I think makes it so beautiful. Um, now we're ready to prove the theorem. The theorem, this is the Hawks or Unique um, proof. A paper from 2001. So again, you have a regular ring. But now I'm going to say that it has prime characteristic B. I'm going to take a radical ideal with big high H. And we're going to show that the H N symbolic power is containing the N power for all. We have already proved this in the case when n is a power of p. Now we have to do all the other things. So how do we do this? Let's fix n. And then we'll prove the statement for this particular n that we said. So we're going to take a u in the hn uh, symbolic power. And what we're going to show is actually that you, well, I wanted to show it's in the power, but what I'm going to show is that it's in the type closure. And then, you know, R is regular. You've been talking about type closure for months now. So I'm going to assume you know all these things, right? Your ring is regular, so if you like, it's weakly F regular. And so that the, all ideals are tightly closed. And so in particular, the tight closure of the power is just the power itself. And so by proving you live in the tight closure, you prove you are in, in I to the end. Um, that's right. So I see a question in the chat. The maximal ideal should be generated by as many elements as the dimension of R. That's correct. So if we go back here, this is what we used in this proof, right? We had um, reduce the problem to the local setting. And we had our regular local ring, so this maximal ideal was generated by as many elements as the dimension of R. Well, but now R is not my original R, so this is my fault for using the same letter, right? Now this is my localized ring, right? I took the, the, the original regular ring and I localized um, at an associated prime of I. So the dimension of this localized ring is actually the height of the prime you localized at. And what you know about that prime is that it was associated to the Frobenius power. So it is associated to the original ideal. Um, and by saying that H is the big height, I'm saying that H is at most, sorry, H is the largest of all the heights of all these cubes. So for whatever Q that you localize at, you always have this in the cloud. So, you know, in, in for the cues that have actually smaller heights, you know, you could maybe take less elements here. But for at least one of these cues, you will need, um, you know, the full on H elements. I'm not saying these are minimal generators for any particular cue. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thanks. Okay, great. Wonderful. Any more questions anyone want to ask? Please do interrupt me. Okay. Feel free to interrupt me anytime. Now I open the chat, and so I will be, I'll be trying to pay attention. Okay, so coming back here, we're trying to prove this containment. Uh, we've remembered our ring is regular, so we're gonna take advantage of type closure. So we're gonna take an element in the symbolic power to prove it's in the type closure of the power. So I know you're all experts on type closure now. This is the very final uh, lecture <laughs> uh, series of this workshop. And so I barely have to remind you of this, but it's early in the morning. It's been a long few months. So let me write down what we want. So we will show that there exists some C. I guess my ring is, um, is a domain. So I'm just going to say it's a non-zero C such that C times U to the Q is in I to the N to the Q, well, to be in the tight closure, I only need this for a large Q, but I'm actually going to prove that for all Q this happens. So I'm going to find the C, 
independent of you that makes this happen for everybody. So it's very much in the psychology. Okay, so now you'll see it's just simple calculation. So what will we do? I fixed them to begin with, and I guess I fixed you, but for now, ignore the you. I fixed n, so let's use uh, the division algorithm. First thing you learn in the first algebra class. By the division algorithm, oh, oh, I'm doing this backwards. I'm going to now take half, okay, now. So for each q, so for a minute, I'm going to fix q, I guess, in my calculation. But then in the end, you'll see that it, what, I, what I'm in, gonna end up writing will not involve Qs at all, okay? So temporarily, I'm gonna fix the Q. I'm gonna take this Q and I'm gonna apply the division algorithm. So this R is the remainder, so it's at least zero and it's smaller than N. So I'll divide Q by N is essentially the point. Um, and now, And I guess I can say also a at least zero because Q is positive. Okay, so with this, I'm gonna start with my U that lived in I to the H N. This is where I started, right? Remember, and I wanna end something like this. This is my goal. I'm gonna put it on the side so we can see it. Okay, so I started here. So if I take u to the a, it lives in the symbolic power to the a. Now, if you remember our lecture on Monday, we said that when we take a product of two symbolic powers, this lives inside a symbolic power. Well, this is a product of multiple ones, but when you take a product of two, it lives inside the symbolic power with order the sum of them. So I took a product of a many things that were the same. I guess I'm gonna add h and a times. <laughs> So I'm going to live inside of here. These are not equal, but I have a containment, which is all I need. Next step, um, I'm going to now take my u to the a, and I'm going to multiply it by i to the hn. So this is really inside i to the hn times the symbolic power. So I'm just using, I'm using the previous line directly. Okay? And now remember that we said that the ordinary powers are always contained in the symbolic powers. So you can think of this now as a product of symbolic powers, which is contained in the symbolic power of the sum of these two. I'm writing a really complicated looking thing, um, but I am going to do this one better. So actually, sorry. Let me raise this. I'm going to replace it by something slightly better. I'm going to note that this remainder r, kind of just by the division algorithm, is something that's strictly smaller than n. So if I take a smaller power, a smaller order, right? The power is a bigger ideal. So this guy is contained in here. And I guess I just said the power is contained in the symbolic power. So here I'm just using n bigger equal, actually n strictly bigger than r, but I just needed bigger equal. And then I use the power contained in the symbolic power. And so I'm gonna do the same thing I was writing down earlier, but now I'll put hr over there. Now the beauty of this is that this is i to the h times a n plus r, which is q. Right, it's up here. This is Q. So this is I H Q. So, so far, this long string of things, I conclude, tells me that I to the H N U to the A is in I symbolic H Q. And now notice that the lemma that we put, we call the theorem before this one, the pigeonhole principle. What does the pigeonhole principle say? He says that when I take the HQ symbolic power, so whenever I take a, a symbolic power that has H times the power of P, I land in a Frobenius power. So I'm gonna use this. This lands in the Frobenius power. Okay, so we're almost there. 
from here, I'm going to uh, take powers of n on both sides, okay? So take a power of n here, you get hn squared. Take a power of n here, you get a n. Oh, this is contains. Oh, and then it's an easy exercise that we're gonna use again today that symbolic uh, oh, ordinary powers and Frobenius powers can use. That's not true with symbolic powers, <laughs> which is what I almost said out loud, right? Ordinary powers and Frobenius powers commute with each other, it's easy. Uh, Frobenius powers commute with products of ideas. Elementary as a set. Conclusion, um, I'm gonna do just one more silly thing. Um, notice that Q is a n plus r. Let me write that here. Q is a n plus r. So in fact, I'm gonna make a very silly statement. Q is at least a n. So if I had written i to the h n squared times u to the q, that would that would be inside of here. Let me write that out. And that would be contained in i to the n plus the minus two. Why do we do all this? Because this power now, first of all, you see that there's no Qs involved in that power. There's just Asian n squared, nothing else. No, no Qs involved. So this is independent of Q. And moreover, you know, R is a domain. So R is a domain and I is non-zero. I should have said that in the beginning. Okay, I didn't put that in my assumptions, but I think we all agree that the theorem we're trying to prove is silly <laughs> for the zero idea. So we're not going to consider the zero ideal. When I take a power of a non-zero ideal in a domain, I get a non-zero ideal. I have a non-zero ideal that has nothing to do with Q. I can choose a C that's inside of this power and that is non-zero. And now choose that favorite C that's independent of Q. And you conclude that this happens. In fact, this was true for all Q. And so we conclude that U lived in the tight closure of this power. I right? guess the definition of living in the tight closure. I mean, it's better than that. But our ring was regular. And as we said in the beginning, um, the type ideals are tightly closed. So this is I to the N. So indeed, we proved I to the HN is contained in I to the N. And uh, we started about eight minutes late. Um, so I'm going to, um, I went three minutes over in this first part, but I think I'm going to, this is a good place to stop. So I'm going to stop here. We're going to take a seven minute break. And then we're going to resume at the time we were supposed to at the, I was going to say 9 a.m., but that's not true for everybody. So at the hour in six minutes, uh, we will resume. But if you want to ask me questions in the meanwhile, you can. So I'll pause here for a minute to see if anyone has questions. I do have one. 